When you hear the phrase soft as steel, what do you think of? While the word steel might conjure up images such as massive high rise buildings, where does the soft part come in? And what exactly does this mean in our work and in our lives? Welcome to the Soft as Steel podcast with your host, Dennis Duran, featuring engaging conversations with a wide range of industry leaders around soft skills, how we practice love, inclusion, social justice, and compassionate leadership that's everlasting in the workplace. And now, here's Dennis Duran. I'm joined today by someone I met over 10 years ago. She's an accountant and lawyer by education. Now, that doesn't tell the story, but does provide clues about why she has been successful over the course of her over 23-year career. Teresa Magnus has been involved in projects and programs that are complex, challenging, and vitally important. She spent a portion of her career working in the regulated utility industry with Southern Company. She has taken on challenges in a wide range of situations, including four years as the CEO of an industrial contracting company, leading a successful turnaround and repositioning of that company for growth. Sounds very technical, very hard skill, and it is at its core. Building relationships, navigating the culture of unionized construction, and simply recognizing and including the fundamental importance of people and the challenges of diversity and inclusion is what has earned her a reputation as an important leader in the construction industry. I know we're going to have a very interesting conversation with Teresa. Teresa, welcome to the Soft to Steel podcast. Thanks for having me, Dennis. I'm excited to be here. Good, good. So you know what my podcast is all about. I know that you've actually listened to one or more of the podcasts. And if you haven't, you'll convince me that you have, just so I have good feelings. So you know that people refer to me as the soft skills guy. So I run from the technical and hard skills aspects of our industry and go directly to the people part. And I know based on my view of you, my experience with you, my knowledge of you, is that the people part in particular in our industry, women, which makes good sense, given your tenure in the construction industry, are all important to you. It's not just about the analysis. It's not just about the budget or forecast. It's not just about the staffing schedule, the strategic plan. It's about people and relationships and how people are treated. That's been an important part of who you are during your career in the construction industry. So my first question is, why is that so important, people? Well, unlike any other industry, ultimately, we are selling the services of people. And there isn't a replacement for people. I saw something flash up on my screen just a couple days ago, and it said, chat GPT, finish the building. Mm -hmm. And it was perfect because there isn't a replacement for people. And construction is an imperfect science. There is a lot of engineering. There's a lot of technical behind it. But ultimately, it comes down to the ability of people in the field forming a team that share a goal to complete the project in order for anything to be successful. Yeah. What do we overlook historically in our industry as it relates to all of that? We overlook the individual. I think it's very easy to treat a person like a commodity, uh, build a manpower curve that shows number of people, you know, heads on a site by the craft that they're assigned to. And you can shift those curves. You can squeeze those curves. You can load them into a schedule. You can load them into a cost report. You can assign costs and production factors to them. And it's very easy to lose the fact that those are individuals. And the executives running construction companies these days are challenged. They're spread thinly. And, you know, maybe it is my opinion that they don't spend enough time in the field with the individuals, meeting them and understanding them, understanding what drives them, understanding what affects them, understanding how to motivate them. Yeah. You know, historically, we use the term shortcuts to describe 
doing things in terms of the process or sequencing of tasks and those kinds of things and and talk about them as being potentially problematic maybe in some uh, situations even catastrophic are we are we as an industry are we still or, or are we maybe on the verge of moving away from shortcutting the value and importance of the individual i don't think so the trends that i see are still moving in the wrong direction uh, we burn through people like they're welding rods, and we create our own shortages. We, we've been talking about a shortage of manpower on a decade, and we have periods of downturn where, where things start to balance out a little bit more. Uh, but when we lay people off, I mean, they just don't come back. And, and so the, the rate of burnout is, is so high in, in the industry, and the layoffs, the, the the sharp peaks, the low valleys, uh, you know, we, we, we create our own and perpetuate our own shortages. And uh, I'm not seeing the trends moving in a positive direction. We're not changing how, how we treat people, how we attract people and keep people in this industry. In a, in a much more significant way, we're a multi-generational industry um, and a big chunk of it uh, the generational changes are our families, families and relatives. You know, my uncle was this, my my uncle was that, my dad was this, and and we just kind of perpetuate that that aspect of of resource in the industry. But it's it's it isn't sufficient. Uh, it isn't sufficient from a number standpoint, uh, and uh, and it overlooks, as you pointed out, the whole notion of how we how we find and attract uh, people to come into the industry uh, to replace those that are leaving. Um, what are your thoughts about all of that multi-generational dynamic that's continuing in our industry? I think it used to be like that, certainly. If you looked at a, at a specific trade or at a construction company, you saw multi-general, multi-generational family participation in projects and trades. And um, most would tell you that their father was harder on them than on everybody else on the crew, right? Mm -hmm. He wanted to ensure that uh, his family members coming behind him carried on the legacy of true craftsmanship. What I've seen more recently is a shift in that. Uh, I have seen more people in the construction industry working hard to ensure that their children go to college and pursue other careers. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's because of their own experience in the industry and the experience of their children watching their, their parents working in the construction industry uh, that have deterred people from bringing their children into it. And it's a hard business. Uh, I can't tell you the number of multi-generational construction companies that are on the market right now, family businesses selling out because there isn't the next generation interested in carrying on with the family business. That's, that's an interesting, your observation about, uh, about uh, firms on the block and one of the, and, and a driving reason for that is that they have no one to take over the reins of the company in and in a generational succession plan. And you also talked about, uh, you know, it's, it's the, your observation about uh, families who have been in the trades or in the construction industry uh, trying to steer their their children away from careers in construction uh, uh, by saying, you know, go to college, get an education. Um, and I'm sure you're, since you're so so well informed about what's going on in the industry, there's there there are a lot of in, initiatives being attempted uh, to try to. Uh, to try to uh, tell tell a new story or a different story about the construction industry uh, to the very youngest, maybe even going down into elementary school, uh, to try to to plant the seed that uh, uh, when you get older, there's there's another path where you can be a professional, which is another another term that's being used uh, by a number of uh, of industry leaders. Uh, you know, one in particular has written you know a number of books, and he uh, a gentleman by the name of Mark Breslin. Uh, and he talks with a great deal of energy about uh, to his audience about you are you are not just tradespeople you are not just foremen you are not just this or that you are professionals uh, and he and he talks about with again a great deal of energy and I don't disagree with that at all 
but uh, but that's not the impression that is being given to uh, younger people in sufficient numbers uh, to alter the curve you talk about. Um, what what are what are what's what's the first thing that comes to your mind about what what the industry can or should be doing different uh, to have a long term uh, a long term effect on how they resource projects in the future? Yeah, what a lot of question, Dennis. Yes, thank you. I, I couldn't agree with you more mm -hmm. that craftsmen who work in the construction industry are professionals. Unfortunately, the industry doesn't value them the same way that they value other professionals. While the rest of the country post-COVID pandemic is evaluating shortened work weeks and mental well-being and balance, the construction industry clings to six and seven-day work weeks. 10 and 12 hour work days. And those things just aren't attractive. Why are they holding on to them uh, with uh, such determination? Because for some reason, the construction industry is unwilling to evaluate its own empirical data. The empirical data exists demonstrating that the most productive work weeks are 40 hour work weeks. The studies that were done on identical projects, the most identical projects that you can have, which are nuclear power plants, mm -hmm. right? They're licensed to the screw. They have to be identical. The data produced evaluating pr productivity and work schedules on those projects four years ago still exists today the most productive work week is 40 hours. And you'll hear the counter argument, but I can't attract people for less than 50 hours. People aren't desiring to work 50 hours. They're desiring the compensation of a 50 hour work week. And so that was taken into account. The projects that were compared had overtime built into schedules versus projects where they were working, the craft were working a 40 hour schedule. And the 40-hour schedule beat the 50-hour schedule in terms of productivity and schedule. And it's well documented, it's published, and it's been presented at conferences literally for decades. And uh, for some reason, the industry clings to these overtime schedules. And, and again, the empirical data, every... NECA, NCAA, or productivity expert who's ever sat on the stand and testified on a productivity claim uses the same scale that shows overtime only decreases productivity the longer that it lasts. I, I, don't, I don't know if it's putting on appearances for the customer. Hey, let me you know, I'm going to add a night shift. I'm going to add a Saturday. I'm going to force these people to work 60 hours. I'm going to recover the schedule. I don't know if it's showing outward appearances to a customer. I don't know if uh, there's a layer of management within the industry who has never been exposed to any of this data, to any of these presentations or to the research. There is a huge, a huge disconnect between what the data shows and how contractors behave in the field. Mm -hmm. And so I've participated for years in industry initiatives to attract better people into um, construction careers, to, to get kids when they're young and motivated and looking to start careers and, and to become professionals to show them look at this great career path and, and how many options you have and the flexibility and the excitement and the tangible results of a career in construction. But the, the, the truth of the matter is you can, you can bring in and cycle through these kids uh, so quickly just in one project because what they experience in the field does not mimic what they were sold in these campaigns. Mm -hmm. Is that in, is that is that with an intent to sell them on coming into the industry, 
or is it a reflection of a true um, appreciation and comprehension of what the realities are in construction on the part of the people who are trying to get the new folks in the door? You know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, if, uh, if it's misinformation or intention, maybe the intention is to have uh, a stable career, full-time employment that doesn't require you to travel all over the country and leave your family behind, uh, that doesn't require you to work uh, 60 and 70 hours a week, give up all your hobbies, give up all your friends, give up your community. Uh, maybe the intention is that, that that it is a good industry and that you will have a nice life working in the construction industry, but that just isn't the way projects are executed. And, and, and these are gross generalizations. I'm sure there are projects uh, that are worked on a 410 schedule and everyone goes home and, uh, you know, enjoys a, a great family, you know, mm -hmm. life. Um, but it, I just I don't I don't see it very much in in I don't see it very much in in my participation in the industry. Hmm. So um, let's uh, one of the things I didn't give uh, due recognition in my introduction of you uh, is uh, is your other uh, is a related body of work around uh, the topic of wellness. Uh, let's let's uh, let's let's go there for a little bit. I, I, I you know I. Th there's there's much more conversation uh, than as little as a few years ago. A few might be three to five years uh, around uh, the topic of the ge the general topic of of uh, caring about the people, um, uh, whether it was in dealing with uh, the issues surrounding mental health, uh, addiction, and suicide, or the 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 notion of wellness as a way to uh, preempt at least mitigate the possibilities of those of those problematic things coming into people's lives. Um, is that is that is there enough traction around that uh, in our industry that it can have the effect of uh, of the industry being seen differently by the potential entrance into the industry? Um, uh, meaning meaning that that if they hear us talking about about uh, caring about people from the standpoint of their of their health, their mental health in particular, uh, and this whole notion of wellness and what that means to the day to day routine of individuals is is that is that showing any positive potential to 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 start to to change the the uh, the view of uh, and then the uh, the the management of initiatives like that by contractors by owners. Uh, to try to make the industry more attractive, I can certainly say that I have had, I have heard more conversation around suicide rates and mental well-being. However, that's where it stops. We're still talking about the problem. There are maybe some minor solutions that the text number for Suicide prevention hotlines is being published widely, but we haven't changed the cause. And, and so as long as the industry continues to treat people the way that it does on the job sites, you're never going to be able to solve the problem of mental ill health and suicide in the industry. So when you look at the risk factors, what are the risk factors that cause such high rates of mental illness and, and uh, suicide in the industry. It is everything about our industry uh, that we perpetuate. Um, maybe not when we're trying to recruit people, but certainly while we're executing projects, right? So uh, here are a few. Uh, travel and nights away from home. Lonely death, a switch correlates with the travel and the nights away from home, employment uncertainty, in no other industry do you do an awesome job and then get laid off the next day. Mm 
and we, we lay everybody off at the end of the project. Lack of feedback, recognition, and reward. Most, most of the time in the industry, the feedback you get is the negative kind. Nobody tells you you did a good, day, good job today. That's what's expected of you. But if you didn't meet production, if you did something wrong, you're going to get the negative feedback. Inadequate staffing. So we know we have a shortage of workforce. Uh, we don't extend project schedules. We just work everybody that shows up to work even harder. Long work shifts, long work hours, lack of weekends, the physical demands of the job, pressured environments, conflicting demands. We tell people we want them to work safely, but we want them to work fast. We want to bring in all these new people to the industry, mm -hmm. but don't forget to hit your, hit your schedule. And then there's the unhealthy coping skills that come with this industry and, and, and it's prevalent. We uh, are very tr quick to treat uh, pain uh, and fatigue and uh, injury with chemicals that have long-term impact on people's health. Uh, when you work all day on a project out of town and then you go back to your you know, apartment, travel trailer, man camp by yourself, there's this uh, loneliness that uh, builds up in your life and you become disconnected from everything about your person. Become disconnected from your family, from your community, from your church, from uh, your hobbies. It's hard to play softball <laughs> on a team out of town mm -hmm. uh, when you can't get there. This is not a good picture. It isn't. And, and you know, the issues surrounding mental well-being aren't limited to just the craft. It's the whole industry. When you look at the suicide rates, the construction managers, uh, the engineers that are on the road, project engineers on the road with their projects, uh, people that are under a tremendous amount of stress, and again, living away from home or at least taken out of a, a normal schedule of having a personal life balanced with the work life. The, those suicide rates are well beyond the averages, uh, and and so are the divorce rates. So are the rates of alcoholism and drug addiction, and 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 so it isn't just the craft. It's it's the engineers, it's the construction managers, it's the salesmen, it, it's everybody that works in the industry that's contributing at that high level. Yeah. I happened to see um, an interview on CNBC of a uh, professor at Harvard, uh, Arthur Brooks. He was there talking about happiness. And he said that there is a, there is a tangible connection between love and happiness, just in general, in a person's life. And, uh, and one, of the, one of the interviewers asked, so are, are, are you happy? I mean, how, 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 how do you achieve happiness? He said, well, I, I achieve happiness by, by teaching about it. I teach people what happiness is, is all about. I, I talk about the neuroscience. I talk about the behavioral aspects. I, I talk about all those things. And that makes me happy uh, because, I, because I have a purpose. So in our industry, when you think about, you know, the, you, you toss two words like that into a vocabulary, particularly with the backdrop of what we've been chatting about for the last few minutes, uh, you, you almost want to choke on them. Uh, because again, to, to suggest that, uh, as you've heard me, uh, and you know this is one of the one of the things that's important to me, and I talk about it every, any chance I get. I talk about love, uh, and what that what that is, what it means, what it does, um, and then and then I also talk about relationships, which you understand well uh, from all the different ways you've been involved in projects and programs over the years, uh, and uh, and the importance of having relationships as part of having a ha happiness in your life. Um, but our industry. Correct me if I'm wrong. Our industry uh, is doing more to, to educate about things like uh, uh, like addiction, uh, opioids, uh, suicide, mental health. Uh, educate about them, uh, but are they are they doing enough to create the environment? Um, and I think your short answer would be no. But uh, but are, are we are we doing are we doing as much as we really do have the capacity to do absent 
the uh, the attention being put on it uh, for it to uh, be for the contractors and the industry in general to be willing to invest in it to teach people about happiness to teach people uh, how to communicate better um, because everything you've talked about it, it, it boils down to the environment uh, and, uh, and and the environment is created by individuals that have certain roles uh, they call them leaders and at different levels uh, and uh, and they're the ones that create the environment that promotes uh, uh, a healthier well environment or a toxic uh, dangerous environment what are your thoughts and you know, I would say we definitely don't do enough uh, while, again, I'm supportive of the advancements that we have made, that we're at least bringing the issue to the table, we're not doing enough to prevent it from happening. And I compare this to physical safety. You know, I remember starting in the industry, which was 27 years ago, that Severe injuries and fatalities were part of every project. It was to be expected. Construction was a dangerous uh, industry to work in. Your compensation reflected the danger of your job. And so uh, people continued to sign up for careers in construction. And we made a decision as an industry that it was no longer acceptable. And the first steps we took were to focus on preventing fatalities. But what we learned over time was that if we wanted to prevent severe injuries and fatalities on project sites, that we needed to focus at the other end of the spectrum and to prevent people from taking unsafe actions. We needed to teach people how to be aware of the hazards and to um, not to take risks with their own personal safety. And I remember the conversations. Uh, this is going to kill our productivity. We're, we're not going to be able to meet our schedules if we put all these safety parameters on our project sites. And it, it didn't happen. Uh, tying off, being safe when we climb ladders, being, being smarter about the way that we perform our construction tasks. It, it hasn't impacted our productivity. We're, 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 we're not impacted adversely because we're working safely now. And, and I think the same thing applies to mental well-being. If we only focus on suicide prevention, then we have allowed a person to deteriorate all the way to that point of hopelessness in their life, which is, which is terrible mm -hmm. for the person, for the crew, for the community. And so if we want to be successful in solving the mental wellness program in the construction industry, we're going to have to start all the way at the other end of the spectrum. And we're going to need to teach people how to be happy and healthy in their lives. And the physical and the mental wellness are very tightly connected. Mm -hmm. And there is, for the people that are tied to the dollar, there already is research that demonstrates that the return on investment Implementing mental well-being programs in a company is somewhere between 200 and 400 percent, depending on how they implement their programs. Mm -hmm. So they will get their money back fourfold, investing in mental well-being. Mm -hmm. And the investment needs to be made on both sides: one on the environment, and secondly for the individual. And it it mirrors it mirrors physical safety programs. The role of a construction company as an employer is to create a safe work environment for all of their employees and then to train the individual in how to their task. The same thing goes for mental well-being. Mm -hmm. A contractor needs to be responsible for creating a psychologically safe workplace and then also teaching its employees how to live a happy, healthy life. Oh my, the simple brilliance of, of those thoughts is, is just too hard to take. Uh, and by that, I mean, it is, is one of the, one of the thoughts that I talked about a little bit in my, in my book that you know about was I, I talked a little bit about this notion that common sense is not that common. 
what you're describing is 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 the application of common sense by adapting a model which the industry finally arrived at at, at being the the right way to do something to have a positive impact on physical safety so what we need to create at least as one ingredient uh, is uh, and the, uh, the the ac- the acronym is JHA a JHA for for uh, for mental wellness um for those who are not familiar with JHA, that means job hazard analysis. What are the things that that make this this do, this job, this environment hazardous to your mental health? Is that a, is that a fair way to describe the the disruption we need to to foster? I have a collaboration with a friend, Catherine Ely, who is a licensed therapist, and for that collaboration, we have published materials on a roadmap for a construction company to create and implement a mental well-being program as part of their existing environmental health and safety program. And we borrowed from the existing infrastructure, not just JHA, but also toolbox talks that focus on topics to help people understand. So through the research, that we did in creating our materials uh, eight domains of a healthy life. And I hadn't really given it much thought myself until I started to read the research. And there are parts of your life that are very easy to forget about, right? So we all know that we're supposed to be physically fit, right? We know we're supposed to go go to the doctor and get checkups. We know we're supposed to take care of ourselves. But how many people do that? We've worked very hard to get benefits, right? To have health insurance for all of our employees and their families. But do we use it? Do we ever go get checkups? I mean, my experience is uh, that it usually takes a heart attack or something pretty serious uh, to get people to go to the doctor. And and then they have a bigger problem than if they had just been taking advantage of preventative medicine. Mm-hmm. We all know that we have to have job. We need find we need finance, right? Like to finance our lives. Uh, but then then things start to fall off. You know, uh, romantic relationship. Everyone needs a romantic relationship in their life. How hard do they define that for themselves? But when I've presented to groups on this domain specifically. The jokes in the room they get laughs, but they're not really that funny. You know, mm-hmm. I had a millwright joke with me that he'd rather sleep with his tool bag than his wife <laughs> and you know it was funny and everybody laughed the mill rates have the highest divorce rate <laughs> of any craft in the industry and so that's an important domain in people's lives having some kind of spirituality taking time for travel and leisure continuing your education having a community and friendships. Mm-hmm. Those are all important things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'll never forget that I had rolling our training out to a group working on a project that had a six day work week, five, 10, and an eight on Saturday. And I'm standing in front of this room of people telling them how they need to look for balance in their lives by intentionally spending time in each of these eight domains in their lives. And I felt ridiculous doing it. Mm. We, wow, well, I believe in the message that I was sending to them. I thought, if I was in their shoes, how would I be receiving this message? And if you're working six days a week, you're spending 60 paid hours on a job site or 58 paid hours on a job site, you have, you know, probably 12 or more hours of commute. You've got to get through the gate because your time doesn't start until you're in your workplace. Parking on these giant jobs is a mile away. And then I'm actually telling these folks, hey, You know, your job is taking up the majority of your life, but don't forget to get eight hours of sleep every night. Get your doctor's appointments. Uh, You know, Mm -hmm. hopefully you can find somebody that takes appointments on Sunday and have a family and spend time with your children and volunteer in your community. And 
You know, I just, I felt ridiculous because how is that ever going to happen? How could anybody ever have a balanced life with the type of work schedules that we have in this industry? Yeah. Well, that work you're doing is important work, and I hope it has a path forward into higher and higher visibility. I'm glad we got to mention it during this conversation. There's a challenging road ahead, and you're connected, tuned in, and sensitive to probably the most significant part of what paints a cautious view forward for our industry. I've often said to groups of individuals that there'll always be a construction industry. There'll always be carpenters and plumbers and electricians and every other trade. They're not going to get replaced by AI and robotics. They may get new tools to use that are technology-based, but there's always going to be people. And so don't worry about your job. Worry about yourself. And it's that last part that you need to keep talking about because as I continue to need talking about soft skills, about the qualities of people, because if if I don't keep talking about it, you'll never hear the idea that soft skills are valuable and and they're the hardest to learn. But I know you're well tuned into that. We could talk for probably two hours, but our time is up. And it's been a joy to converse with you. I appreciate how thoughtfully you responded to my questions, both the loaded ones and the unloaded ones. And I know that whoever listens to this conversation is going to get a lot out of it from hearing what you had to say. So thanks for coming on the Soft to Steel podcast. Thank you for having me. I hope that even if just one person listens to this podcast and decides to make a difference, it will be well worth it. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Teresa. Thanks for joining us today for this episode of the Soft to Steel podcast with your host, Dennis Duran. Dennis is the author of Soft as Steel and a leading speaker and trainer for organizations across many industries and verticals. To learn more about the work Dennis is doing to activate soft skills in the workplace, contact him at DennisDuranSpeaking.com. Be sure to check out his book, Soft as Steel, on Amazon or wherever books are sold. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or wherever you'd like to get your podcasts. And please remember to share this episode with your friends, colleagues, and anyone you feel would benefit from the conversation. We'll see you next time on the Softest Steel Podcast with Dennis Duran. Produced by Audavita Studios. Connect your voice to the world.